I want to talk to you about uh, living in the face of death. I want to talk to you about a hope for the future. Dying is inevitable, but living is not. Death is not the most powerful thing in life. Life is the most powerful thing in life. And love is the engine of life. There's something that's more powerful, that's stronger than death. And I, to be clear, I'm not going to talk about life after death, but rather life before death. And I want to tell you the story of my daughter, Esther Grace. Esther Grace died from a, a rare lung cancer two years ago. She was 16. She would have been a senior right now, celebrating her senior year. And recently, her younger brother, Abraham, uh, said, Dad, he was thinking about Esther, he said, Dad, is, is heaven real? Is it a real place? Is it real? We were driving in the car, and I paused and said, well, let me ask you a question. Is love real? Esther Grace was born with hair. Uh, people said she looked like a character out of Dr. Seuss. Uh, we'd go into the grocery store and they'd say, I'm so sorry, bad hair day? And her mother and I would say, no, we love it. It's the most amazing marshmallow-colored hair we've ever seen. She arrived to the world to the loving embrace of two parents and two older sisters, and brothers would follow later on. And from the beginning, her sisters nicknamed her Esty, but I called her my star. And when we were, uh, when, she was, when she was four, I went to teach in Saudi Arabia, and the children followed me by some months. A few days after they arrived, uh, Esther and her seven-year-old, Esther was four, and her seven-year-old sister went out to the playground. We lived um, uh, not on a Western compound, but we lived uh, with the Saudis and other nationalities, which was fantastic. But there were some local children who were playing toss, like you would play egg toss, where you'd throw the egg and then you'd take a step back. And yet, on closer inspection, uh, they realized that they were tossing a kitten. And uh, Esther and, and Evangeline, you know, used what Arabic they knew, la, la, mafi, halas, stop it, that's our kitten. So the kids gave them the kitten, and for a few days they, they adopted the the kitten, without their parents' knowledge. <laughs> but I said at the time, I said that Esther's, Esther's life was, uh, she was a, a stadium full of internal confidence and, and motion. Just one other story from, from Arabia. Uh, one day, the three little ones came in. Esther went flat on her back in the hallway next to her brother Graham and the older sister. I said, Dad, Mom, look, I've got a coffee can. I want to show you something. Shut the door. So they closed off the hallway there. We were excited to see what trick they were going to show us. She proceeded to unscrew the coffee can, and it, which was full of Saudi beetles. Uh, and, and, and she proceeded to pour them on these two kids who began to scream with delight. And, and uh, their mother and I just screamed. But she was the caretaker, or I should say, uh, the guide for an interpreter for her younger brother, Graham, who was born with some special needs. And uh, she would serve as his guide. And later, she would actually be present at the birth of uh, our youngest son, Abraham. She actually cut the umbilical cord. A few minutes before, when Abraham was presenting himself to the world, Esther said to those gathered there, the midwife and others, she said, when I grow up, I'm adopting. No way, no way I'm going to do this. And it was clear from, from that early age, it was clear that her message uh, was, was certain. Somebody somewhere is waiting to love you. Somebody somewhere is waiting for your love. All too soon, she grew up or got older and boys came around and she liked boys and they certainly liked her and she was a charmer. Um, her life was still motion and she continued to grow and thrive and her teacher said that she was an amazing burst of sunshine, that her life was like a burst of sunshine. 
And she said from an early age that she wanted to grow up to be uh, an author and that Harry Potter was her favorite, favorite book and she wanted to grow up and be an author. But right in the middle of the fairy tale, when she was 12 years old, came the cancer. It was Thanksgiving Day, 2006, and she was diagnosed. So the clouds had moved in and were about to cover the sunshine. And of course, she isolated herself and felt discouraged and overwhelmed and depressed, and she said she felt useless. And she wrote, unbeknownst to us or anyone, she wrote a letter to her future self when she was 14. And in the letter, she talked about boys, of course, and her illness, and uh, her family, and her friends. And she said, uh, look, if you're still alive, when, you, when, when the, this email shows up, you'll be 17. And remember that you wanted to do something with your life. Remember you wanted to do something awesome. Well, if you haven't done it yet, there's still time because you can try, and if you fail, you can try again until you succeed. And she said, remember to read, because reading is a lovely thing. She, however, was a welcomer, so she began to develop an online community uh, of, of friendship with people. She reached out and, through her blogs and vlogs, created this community, was a part of it. And she found an amazing home in the wonderful land of Nerdfighteria. You've heard of Nerdfighteria? Okay. And her favorite author shifted. She uh, found that she uh, really liked uh, John Green as an author. So she read his books and had an opportunity to go to an event where he was uh, speaking. And she was at the event, and she, 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 she described it, she f was fangirling. There was John over there, and her heart was beating, and her hand was shaking with water, and big sister Abigail said, go over, introduce yourself. It's you know, a rare moment, he's standing there alone. And she said, oh, I can't do it. So she walked over, and she s put out her hand. She said, hi, I'm Esther. And he said, oh, Esther, that's such a lovely name. And then she said, blurted out, you're awesome. <laughs> 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 and uh, she... Uh, she began to, her, her, um, her visibility, of course, increased because John obviously was charmed by her. He uh, was touched by her story. He got to know her. Uh, Esther went to a few other meetings. They spent time together, uh, and she um, got to, to know him through the phone and through the Internet. And her, because of that, her visibility was raised, and she had a greater influence and impact on the lives of people online. And she uh, was online giving advice, some of it trivial, some of it very serious. You know, what about your cancer? What about your relationships? And so on. And she tweeted, uh, you know, at one point she had to go back to the hospital. The outcome was uncertain. She was 16 by then. And she said, thank you, lungs. I love you too. And I just want to get better, she said, uh, so that I don't have to keep worrying about getting better. And she uh, tweeted, you know, if I had three talents, three gifts, I'd love to be able to reach into bodies without hurting them, of course, she said, and take out all the cancer. I'd like to be able to uh, dance again. And I'd like to have the gift of words. Well, it was clear. She was surrounded by her family and her friends, and uh, her star was in its asc ascendance, and her message was the same. There's somebody somewhere who's waiting to love you, Somebody somewhere is waiting for your love. But sadly, her illness was putting her in the position of uh, being tethered to the four corners of her room. And I went to her not long before she passed away. I said, uh, Esther, how am I going to live without you? How am I going to survive without you in my life? You're, you're my star. And I thought she'd say, well, Dad, here's what you do. Here's the three ways to deal with grief, you know. You first you... But she just looked at me and motioned to come on over. And then she held me. And the child became parent to the father. She comforted me, and I knew that we were going to be okay. And then, sadly, a few days later at the hospital with her, one sister singing to her and her other sister holding her, and all of us gathered there, she slipped away. And a few minutes after that, with the doctor there, 
I said, thinking of another great person who left too soon, I said, uh, now she belongs to the heavens. And now she belongs to you. Well, you can imagine how that was. We were devastated, and uh, the next day, um, her sisters were heartbroken. Her mother, I came downstairs to find my wife in Esther's bed, holding her pillow, railing against the injustice of it all. You know, Esther was going to start her GED. She was going to go to college. She was uh, increasing in her visibility. She was making such a difference as an advocate. We were looking into lung transplants, and there was so much hope, and she was taken from us. And Graham uh, left messages on the answering machine uh, saying, if anyone out there uh, can just get this message to Esther, tell her that I love her, and tell her she can come and visit me anytime she wants. And I was sad too, and I sat in a corner for some time until I realized Esther would think, Dad, you gotta get up. And I'd promised her three things, one of which was to get a tattoo. I said, and I told her what the tattoo was going to look like. Do you, do you want to see the tattoo? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right, I got a picture of it here. It's, it was right there. Love is stronger than death. Love is stronger than death. Not long after that, after that uh, I went to the cemetery for the first time alone, and I was there, and uh, I said, uh, I was having a conversation with Esther. I just imagined if I could have one wish, I could bring her back from the dead and just talk to her for a few minutes. So I imagined that. I was kind of smiling about that, thinking about that. And I could, then I suddenly could just imagine her voice saying to me, Dad, you used your one wish to bring me back from the dead? Something so insignificant? You used the wish for that? You could have, you could have ended world hunger. You could have, uh, you could have, uh, um, b- provided a clean water supply for the entire world, you could have cured cancer. Dad, Dad, most importantly, you could have uh, introduced me to Daniel Radcliffe. That's what she <laughs> might have said. But it encouraged us that so many people loved Esther. And they responded with uh, emails and comments on her, on her video blogs and cartoons and oil paintings and songs that people wrote about her. And even just as recently as last week, somebody said, when I have a daughter someday, I'm going to name her Esther. And I love you, Esther, present tense. And when I have kids someday, they're going to know your name. And when I have grandkids someday, they're going to know your name. You will not be forgotten. And then amazingly, uh, John Green wrote his uh, new best-selling novel, The Fault in Our Stars. And... <laughs> It's a great, great book, and dedicated it to her, which continued to increase uh, traffic our way and increase her visibility. He would talk to her about the book. He said, I'm gonna write a book. Can I talk to you about being sick? Would that be all right? I'm not invading, invading your privacy. I just said, no. I got John Green on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> but she eventually, of course, I've got this tombstone here. It says, rest and awesome, which he, uh, John, is a phrase that John Green used. And the thing about Esther, she was, born, she was buried with, um, with, with a, the Star Won't Go Out bracelet, but also with uh, a Save Darfur bracelet on her wrist. You see, Esther uh, rests in awesome. Um, we work for awesome, right? We are working for that. Her life was fully planted here on the earth, on the ground. This is where she lived. This is where she moved. This is where she had her being. This is where her heart was. She was just worried about us. Would we be okay? Yeah. We're going to be okay. See, this star won't go out. This is from the end of Future Me. And I think she turned out pretty good. So, yes, Abraham, love is real. Love is absolutely real. It's the most powerful thing in the universe. Dying is inevitable, but living is not. 
Death is not the most powerful thing in life. Life is the most powerful thing in life, and the engine of life is love. Architects of the future, you have a chance from this day forward to live, getting inspiration from Esther, to live a life that she lived, a life of awesome that was rooted in this earth with a view toward the future and planted firmly in the present. You have the possibility of taking, of building structures of hope that, 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 that are built on the inside from, they come from the inside out and they, and, and they flow like a, like a river to those who are waiting hungry to receive their embrace and nourishment from the outside in. So for everyone who has such a hopeful vision of the future, I say, let the building begin. Thank you.